Reading is just a habit you gotta form in all of life. Books don't change people's sentences. Reading good, solid, reform, Puritan literature, reading especially the classic, that's had the biggest impact on my life. Well, good day and welcome to another episode of the Reformers Bookcast, a weekly podcast hosted by Reformers Bookshop. My name's Tom Eglinton, the manager here at Reformers, and today we are speaking uh, with uh, Pastor Ruben Bren- Bre- Bredenhoff. I should have checked that one, sorry. Bredenhoff, how are you? Ruben, thanks for joining You're us. You're well. It's great to be here. Thanks, Tom. Now, uh, Ruben, you're the past. Uh, you're the author, sorry, of this book, Weak Pastor, Strong Christ, um, Developing a Christ-Shaped Gospel Ministry. Um, I very much enjoyed this book as um, as a, a fellow uh, worker in the ministry. I'm an elder at our church, and it was very helpful as I thought through my responsibilities there. Uh, so thank you for writing it. But before we get into the book, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a Canadian. Uh, living in Australia, been uh, blessed to live here for six years uh, together with my uh, lovely wife, Rebecca, and we have four daughters. I serve a church in Mount Missouri, which is in the, the southern suburbs of, uh, of Perth. And I have been a pastor for almost 17 years now, uh, served about 10 years in Canada, and then uh, accepted a call to come to Australia and have labored here. Uh, I have done a PhD in New Testament studies oh. at uh, St. Mary's University in London. So I, I do have an interest in studying the Bible academically, but also bringing it to the people of God through teaching and preaching. Yep. Well, and what in particular was the PhD on? I wrote my PhD on the parable of Lazarus and the rich man oh. in uh, Luke 16. A fascinating one. Very fascinating, yeah. So uh, fascinating. Just, to, just to jump onto that little thing for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> what, what, um, what was your view in terms of how much you can take out of it literally – in terms of hell, I think that's the big the big question um, out of that parable. That is a big question. Is it meant to give us a accurate geography of the afterlife? I I don't think that it is. the The point of the parable is the the teaching about showing mercy to the poor. Mm-hmm. The the emphasis in the the parable is on how the rich man should have responded to the need of Lazarus at his, at his gateway. So some of the afterlife imagery um, may or may not reflect reality in the sense that, you know, this is how it's going to be. Uh, Some of the geography that Jesus uh, uses or the the imagery is meant to serve the the conversation that Abraham is then able to have with the, the rich man as he suffers torments. Uh, but it is a fascinating parable, definitely. Yeah. You have a, a named a named character, Lazarus, the only named character in any of the parables. So there's a lot there to explore, 300 pages worth. <laughs> I'm sure many, much ink has been spilt on that parable over the years. Yes, that's right. Um, now, I- interestingly, I guess even... Uh, so your your book that you that you've written is on um, the character of of pastoral work, and you've looked at the book of two Corinthians, um, but instead of perhaps taking it like we normally would, and you you sort of read a a passage and try and work out what it's saying, you've uh, really gone behind the scenes, as it were, to understand the relationship that Paul was having with the Corinthians and what the way that Paul expresses himself and deals with the Corinthians, teaches us about pastoral ministry. And I, I really found that way of reading the Bible a, an interesting thing. I, I hadn't um, seen it done so blatantly before. Uh, can you sort of talk us through how you came to see 2 Corinthians that way? 
um, whether that's a valid way of reading the Bible and maybe, yeah, I'm just, in, just interested around that, that perspective. Sure. Yeah. I think when we try to understand Paul's pastoral ministry, we quickly turn to places where he gives explicit instruction in pastoral work. So the, the pastoral epistles, uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and there Paul talks about how Timothy ought to conduct himself or Titus. But my thinking in studying 2 Corinthians for Paul's pastoral theology is really rooted in the fact that Paul pastored his churches sometimes in person, sometimes through emissaries or representatives, but he often pastored them uh, through his letters. And 2 Corinthians is a remarkably personal letter that Paul has written to this congregation. He knew the congregation very well, probably better than he knew some of the other churches since he had labored in Corinth for about 18 months and went back and forth uh, at least a couple of times. So he knew the Corinthians well, and in the letter, he expresses some of the intimate concern that he has for them, his love for them, uh, his fears for them. Um, So through eavesdropping, as it were, on Paul's pastoral conversation with the Corinthians, I tried to draw out some of the the key lessons. How how is Paul regarding his relationship with the Corinthians? And how did he want them to regard him? And I, I do think it's legitimate while there are certain things that have changed uh, from Paul's time to ours, uh, to draw out some of the lessons for pastors today. You know, we're not, we're not apostles in the same way. We wouldn't claim authority from God in the direct way that Paul does. Um, you know, it's interesting that when he, when he is criticized, he, he doesn't seem to acknowledge any wrongdoing. Mm. I'm not sure that that would be good counsel to give to pastors. <laughs> um, but I think the, the, the tone in which Paul uh, speaks to the Corinthians is something that there's a lot for pastors to learn from today. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is fascinating because I think there's... Well, what, what, what do you see in terms of uh, how pastors are taught about how to pastor um, these days? Do, do you have any view on on, uh, I guess, the trajectory of, of the church in general um, as to how pastors are, uh, are encouraged to do their work? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, when I came out of seminary, I had a lot of theological training. I had a lot of training in how to explain texts and mm. to, to preach them. Uh, we had some training in, in pastoral theology, uh, but in terms of a, an overarching model or, or a, a pattern to follow, um, certainly for my part, I, I didn't receive a lot of training. So as I entered ministry, I had a lot of personal questions about how am I to regard the people of God? Uh, what should I um, do for them? How how devoted should I be to them? And I think every seminary student is familiar with the, the image of a shepherd and his sheep, right? So when Jesus mm. tells Peter to feed my sheep or tend my lambs, right? there, there's a, a model there that, that is helpful. There's the sense of a, a caring shepherd, devoted uh, sheep that are sometimes difficult to deal with. Um, but beyond that, as I started my own ministry, I, I did struggle to find what is a good model. And I think my, my studies and my reflections and just my personal devotions led me to two Corinthians where I think the idea, or some of the ideas that come across in two Corinthians, I found very helpful for how does a pastor actually approach and regard his congregation? Mm. Um, um. Yeah, and and do you think, in t- I guess in terms of like full time paid 
pastors. Um, I think at times it can be viewed as a job, and so you move from church to church, and um, you, your goal is to do the work that you're, you're that's expected of you, and those sorts of things. Um, did Paul view his work as a pastor to the Corinthian church that way? I don't think he would have spoken of it as a job. It was a an obligation placed on him. Uh, he says somewhere, I'm, I'm compelled to preach. Uh, he felt really heavily the burden of being a servant of Christ, or he, he speaks in 2 Corinthians and elsewhere too about um, being a slave of Christ. Um, you know, notably, he was very willing to work for free in Corinth, right? To, to do his work there without any financial compensation, uh, simply because of his conviction that this was a task that the risen Lord Jesus had given him to do, uh, the great privilege that he had, had laid on Paul. Uh, so Paul's total devotion to that calling of Christ comes across well, not just in 2 Corinthians, but in, in so many of his letters, the willing the willingness of Paul to pour himself out. Yeah, uh, it certainly does. And there's a lot of different ways that he describes himself in terms of his relationship to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians. And you bring out a number of them. You've mentioned slave um, and apostle and, and a few others are in your book as well. But one that really uh, struck a chord with me and got me thinking was that uh, Paul relates to the Corinthians as a father. Um, can you explain to us, uh, I guess, how how Paul thought of himself as a father and why that's something that uh, pastors can take on and, and uh, work on in terms of how they view their congregation? Sure. Already in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how he had brought the congregation to life, as it were, how he had um, fathered them in the faith through his preaching there initially, uh, that through his work in Corinth, they had come to know the Lord Jesus, uh, and they could regard him as their their spiritual father. And Paul speaks in this way to some of the other congregations as well, to the Thessalonians. He speaks about you know, his, his gentleness among them. Um, not even as a father, but even as a mother. Mm. Um, so we see that language of father being used in some of the other letters, but I find it uh, remarkable in 2 Corinthians, how in a number of places Paul speaks of his his view of the Corinthians as you know a father speaking to his children, and he, he pleads with them uh, that they would uh, open their hearts to him as, as children would to a father. I think that that image of a father with his children does convey the, the sense of intimacy of relationship that Paul has with the Corinthians. As I said before, that he knew them so well, uh, their relationship had suffered a lot of strain, and yet he he cared for them so deeply. Uh, so he he pours out his heart as a father, um, asking, praying that his children would respond so that he can continue to, to nurture them, to see them mature in Christ and to remain faithful until the day of Christ. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I think that image of a father is just so helpful because mm. it, it captures the complexity of his relationship as well. That it, it was like you say, it's this intimate relationship that had conflict and difficulty. Um, but Paul wasn't concerned with uh, have having them back in fellowship for some gain that he might achieve out of it. It was for their own good, which is mm-hmm. exactly the way a father feels about his children. Um, he just mm-hmm. wants, he wants them to have the best in, in, and he knows that for them to follow Christ is the best thing for them. And um, it's, it's a, an astonishingly good picture, I think, in terms of how much it captures of the complexity of, of the situation. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there's a uh, a place where Paul speaks of his his jealousy for the Corinthians' purity. 
and he he says that he wants to present them as a as a pure uh, maiden virgin a pure bride for christ and it's again the idea of a, a father protecting the the chastity of of his daughter and, and wanting to see his daughter remain faithful until the day of marriage uh, and you know the the corinthians had been harassed they had been uh, troubled by rival teachers and paul wants to preserve them so that they they are preserve the corinthians so that they are truly pure uh, for christ and faithful until the day of christ yeah it's like he wants to he wants to be the one that walks them down the aisle and exactly know, with such yeah. with a smile on his face and and yeah. uh, he talks about how he boasts of them and he wants he's so filled with pride at, and confidence in their calling and their election and their sanctification that's right yeah, yeah. and he he prays for them as well there are a number of places where he he doesn't report the prayers as he does in some of the other letters but he uh, speaks of how he he's praying continually for their maturity for their faithfulness and that he in turn desires their prayers for him mm. i think for a for a pastor today as as we think about our churches that that sense of concern you know, not just expressed in preaching or teaching or pastoral work but simply a life of being in prayer for our our congregations, uh, I don't want to say spiritual children, um, but in a, a certain sense, God entrusts congregations to the care of pastors that they would have that, that close and intimate concern for them. Yeah. And and so I guess that's that's a good uh, segue moving into how, how have you found that uh, as you've thought about Paul's work as a pastor to the Corinthians, how have you found that that uh, what you've discovered out of that has shaped and changed the way that you approach ministry? In quite a few ways, I would say. Um, perhaps the, the place I'd begin is just with Paul's weakness, which mm. that's reflected in the, the title of the book as well, uh, that he saw himself as a weak pastor. And I think as a pastor myself, there are days when I feel invincible and strong and like I'm you know, super competent. Uh, we probably all have days like that. Um, but then mercifully, God gives us you know, a more difficult day where we feel you know, our sense of inadequacy, our sense of um, being not able to, to do the work in our own strength. And for me personally, that's been a, a lesson of 17 years and it continues to be a lesson that when I see my own failures in different ways or my see I see my inadequacies my struggles with criticism from congregational members or or perhaps comparisons to other ministers who seem more talented or uh, eloquent that I can think of Paul and find in him a, a kindred spirit. And he too was fully aware of his weakness. He, he wasn't perfect. Uh, he, he speaks at, at length in two Corinthians about his sufferings physically, his sufferings mentally, uh, his own lack of eloquence, lack of rhetorical training. In many ways, he was not what you would, want in a uh, pastor would at least that's how he was presented in the Corinthian congregation. They, they thought he was not worth time listening to. So when I read of those struggles that Paul had as a weak pastor, I, I am encouraged by that because Paul, rather than look to himself and look to his own confidence or his own sense of uh, ability that he continually looks to Christ. And for myself, that that's an encouragement that I need often, that it's not up to me to save God's people. It's not up to me to sanctify them or to mature them. But I, I continually 
am exhorted, encouraged, uh, convicted to go back to Christ, uh, who is strong and capable and full of grace for his people. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, particularly in today's environment of uh, YouTube preachers and you know, like ev- everyone in your congregation has the at their fingertips the ability to listen to the best preachers in the world. Um, and on top of that, you've got social media and the, um, I guess the the well known pastors of our day have will present as these impenetrable fortresses of godliness <laughs> and and uh, you know rigor of thought and all these sorts of things, um, and so it's 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 so true that in comparison to that we it's very easy to feel weak um and it's easy to look weak it, but from t- to your congregation and you point out in your book how Paul actually exalted in that he emphasized it and as they're attacking him he's saying he's, he has an opportunity to present his resume i think you say and list all of the remarkable things but he keeps coming back to this fact that no i am weak i am weak i am weak um and he really just wants to see them brought to Christ. That it's not. He doesn't want them to glory in him. He wants them to glory in, in Jesus. That's right. Yeah. yeah, he very reluctantly will speak about himself in two Corinthians, um, but he'll he'll speak about the things that are to his detriment, or the things that would be socially unacceptable to the Corinthians. And in so doing, he wants the attention not put on himself, but on the glory of Christ. And he he speaks of how he comes to the end of himself and realizes that or God tells him that his grace is sufficient. I think that is a, an important message for, for any Christian, obviously, but for pastors as well who are we ought to be very aware of our our failings and our shortcomings uh, that we can, as long as we are pointing people faithfully uh, and zealously and passionately to the, the risen Christ, uh, we know that Christ's people will be well cared for and that they, they will be preserved. Yeah, I, I think um, personally I find that there can be two extremes. Um, I think pastors can... Uh, want to present themselves as as perfect um, or can be perceived as perfect by their people um, but on to combat that they might you, you might think oh well maybe I should talk about all my failings and just tell everyone how bad my life is mm. um, do you how would you view the, that sort of dichotomy what would your advice be to someone thinking through those things Working from the example of Paul, I would say you know, he wasn't um, he wasn't averse to speaking about his own challenges. He wasn't you know he would be he would be open in his letters about his struggles with sin or his struggles with despair. Right, he, he would acknowledge that the, the weight of pastoral care was a, a burden on him. Uh, but in in so speaking of himself personally it was always to quickly turn the attention back to christ and Mm. i think my own view would be that's a a model that's an example that is is worth following Uh, we don't want preaching or pastoral interaction to be about us as pastors Um, it should be real that you know we acknowledge we are broken people in need of a savior. We don't have it all figured out. Um, So our our pastoral interaction or our preaching should have a sense of reality in it, that we're not living in an ivory tower or that we're not immune to temptation, uh, but that we resolutely and persistently uh, point people to where the the real hope is. And that's in our Lord Jesus. Mm. Yeah, that's such an encouragement. Um, 
Now, uh, you, you mentioned there are a few things that that had shaped your your ministry after looking at Paul you, and weak weakness and Christ-centeredness, I guess, bringing everything back to Christ and seeing your main job as, as presenting Christ to people um, are two things. Were, were there anything else? I'd say also Paul's uh, great sense of devotion to his people. Mm. Um, he he poured his life out for them. Um, he was willing to to work very hard, and he, he speaks in two Corinthians about the the concern that he feels for all the churches, uh, and he even highlights that as as the greatest of all his sufferings, even greater than being shipwrecked and flogged and on the open sea, he says, besides all these, I face daily my concern for the churches and who is weak and I do not feel weak, uh, who is tempted and I do not feel the pain of it. And he's not complaining. Uh, he's just acknowledging this is suffering that I'm going through and I, I'm willing to do it because that's what Christ did for his people. Christ gave that self-sacrificing uh, work for his people. Uh, and so when I read Paul, I'm encouraged also to remain devoted to the care of God's people. Uh, there will be sleepless nights or you know, nights of tossing and turning. Uh, there will be anguished prayers uh, or just a sense of frustration. I, you know, we can't change these people. Uh, we'd love to change their hearts, but we, you know, I lack the ability but just to stay with God's people, to uh, remain devoted to them, uh, to keep reaching out in a, a fatherly way, a brotherly way, and be willing to, to stay with the people of God like Paul did for the Corinthians and, and ultimately like Christ did for his church. Yeah, and it's, it is a fascinating thing in 2 Corinthians, I think, how there's this great tension in the relationship he's been through a lot he's rebuked them he's been hassled by them he's he they've tried to push him away on all of these things but paul keeps coming back to them keeps sending people to them um yeah. keeps pouring out his heart to them telling them what he wants uh, uh, to see in their life and the, and the hopes that he has for them um yeah. it's this relentless care and devotion like you say it's quite incredible um yeah, they had given him every reason to to walk away, yeah, to run away, and I, I think every pastor can relate to moments like that in ministry too, where you've given of yourself and you haven't received thanks or the compliments that you were hoping to get back. Um, you, know, you you might feel unappreciated and disenchanted. Uh, and you know, not to not to say you know too lightly that that that's just going to happen, and you have to keep going. But just to realize that this this is part of ministry, uh, that there will be um, the frustrations with God's people, sinners as they are. Um, that uh, a pastor, being a sinner himself, has to realize God has shown immense grace to me, and I need to continue to show that grace and that fatherly gentleness and that fatherly joy in God's people moving forward. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, as I think about it, as, as we're talking and as I've read your book, um, it's interesting to me that the work of a pastor is hard. Uh, it's got complications. It's, it's done out of weakness. Um, in, in most situations, it doesn't have glory, it doesn't have a claim, it doesn't have fame. Um, why do you think God designed it this way? It's a good question. I think God knows we are all tempted by pride. I think we all look for earthly rewards uh, and that, that's a a lurking a danger for any pastor, even if you just have a small church and a small platform, as it were, uh, you know, the, 
the temptation to to feel good about your work, even if you've only preached to 30 people that, you know, if you receive a lot of praise, it's, it's so hard to not be ensnared by the, the idol of self-aggrandizement, you know, idolatry, um, feeling satisfied in oneself or in one's work. The compliments can be more dangerous than the criticism. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we love our we love our compliments, um, and it, I think it's it's right that pastors be appreciated for their work. Uh, Paul wanted to be appreciated as well, mm. um, but yeah, I think God lays this beautiful but difficult burden on pastors without a lot of earthly rewards, other than the reward being in the privilege of serving Christ and getting to minister uh, his gospel to people. Uh, that's that's the great joy. Yeah, so that, that's good. So pri- the removal of pride is is one benefit of the way God's designed it. Um, I think the other, and this, this is what you, uh, one of the things you bring out in the book as well, is that it just, the whole point of redemption is that Christ is glorified. Um, and so by having weak pastors... You can see mm. you can see the strong Christ. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, have you found in your own ministry that 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 plays out in in real life? I guess the the idea of Christ building His church and not you. Certainly. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's a lifelong lesson of not resting in myself, mm. um, putting compliments or criticism to one side, um, and preaching to myself, uh, first of all, uh, that my work is about bringing the, the message of Christ to his people, uh, reminding myself I'm an ordinary person ministering to ordinary people about an extraordinary gospel. And just going back to that, uh, it is it is easy to do the work out of a sense of routine at times. Uh, there's, you know, the, the daily or the weekly rhythms of preparing sermons, preaching sermons, teaching and visiting. Um, but you know, for myself personally, just remaining focused on the, the beauty of the gospel of Christ, uh, letting that be my joy. My joy should not come through outcomes uh, in preaching or that that our church is growing or that uh, I'm able to reach certain career goals. Uh, But the the outcomes ultimately are, is Christ being glorified? Is his church growing in him? Um, Can I be reasonably confident that they will be presented mature on the day of Christ? Uh, Those are the things that, I have to continually remind myself, you know, this is, this is what it's for. Uh, there's a, a chapter in the book about just having ministerial goals or having goals for ministry and putting aside human goals, uh, career goals or aspirations and remembering the goal of um, growing in faith and knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ and being presented mature on the day when he returns. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful picture, and and it, I'm just yeah, it's been great to have have your you open up a little bit to us, or in Paul's words, you open your heart to us a, a bit and about your experiences through that, and um, and I just want to thank you for for coming on the podcast and, and talking us through those things, Ruben. Thanks very much for having me, Tom. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, no worries. Um, so you've been listening to the Reformers Bookcast. Uh, we've been talking to Ruben Bredenhoff on his book, Weak Pastor, Strong Christ, um, which I'd encourage anyone in pastoral ministry to read. Um, it's great encouragement. And uh, you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts and catch up on any previous episodes um, at reformers.com.au forward slash bookcast. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.